Jürgen Moltmann is probably a name that you've never heard. He's a German Reformed theologian. He's the professor emeritus of systematic theology at the University of Tübingen. He wrote several pivotal books, and he is today 96 years old. But what I remember most about him is one sentence that I learned in seminary that has been uh, sort of an impactful moment for me ever since then. It's one phrase that I think will be relevant for all of us today in a way that I hope will move us to think differently about our past while we also use it to alter our future. And that might sound like a big promise, but I assure you that it isn't if you will lean in with me. If you'll give me all you've got and find the presence of God and the voice of God with me together today. I'm going to give you Moltmann's quote in just a minute. But first, I'm going to invite you here and everywhere at every one of our campuses and online, wherever you are, would you join me together and let's pray. God, we came to church today and we brought with us all kinds of things. We came with some strife from earlier this morning or from yesterday or this past week. Things that were weighing on us, things that we brought in to church with us today. And we got stuff for after church today. Later today and tomorrow, the week ahead, worries that are weighing on us. And we're asking you, God, to help clear our minds for just a few minutes at least. Give us reprieve from all that stuff. Clear all of it away just so that we can hear your voice. It's why we're here. We're asking for you to help us hear you and experience your presence today. We pray this in the name of Jesus together, and everyone agreed and said, amen. In order for revolution to last, you must revere the sacred symbols of the past, all the while ruthlessly revising them. In order for revolution to last, Moltmann said, you must revere the sacred symbols of the past, all the while ruthlessly revising them. Revolution simply means change, right? Sweeping Reform, And while we usually think of revolution as history and governments, the American Revolution, for example, we, we can agree that revolution really is just change on a large scale, right? And we can also agree that the world is constantly changing. We might argue, we would argue, if we wanted to enter into a debate together about whether or not the change that's happening is good or not so good, and and we would have people on all sides of that, but nobody would argue that the world is changing. It's constantly changing, like it or not. That's just the way life is, right? I mean, let's consider first hairstyles. I mean, through the years, even those of you who are still blessed to comb and to brush, to straighten, to cut, to color, to dry, to curl, you don't do it the way you used to, right? Right? Because hairstyles have changed a lot in the past 20 or 100 years. For sometimes they come full circle. But the way that we display our pinnacle with our follicles is revised from decade to decade. That's just the way culture is, right? It's going to keep changing. How about decor? As we move through time, what is considered to be beautiful in terms of decor, it changes. Just one picture here. From the 1970s, somebody decided that this is what a beautiful kitchen would look like. No offense uh, to anybody here whose current kitchen is avocado through and through. I'm simply saying that you might have some trouble when you go to replace your refrigerator with another one that is lime green. Some companies, though, they understood Moltmann's point, even if they never heard the phrase. Again, he said, if you want revolution to last, you have to revere the sacred symbols of the past, all the while ruthlessly revising them. I have a 1963 Corvette Stingray. This is not my car, uh, but mine is very similar to this. It was my dad's, and he gave it to me. And for Corvette enthusiasts, the genius of the vet is that it has maintained its features with some design changes so that you always see the Corvette in it, even as it modernizes through time. 
its ancestry from an era gone by is still evident in the most current model in the most current generation. Now, I'll never be able to afford this one, but still the DNA of my vet is embedded right here. I can see it. Other car brands that maybe some of us could name, they've come and gone, but this one has endured for seven decades. For revolution to last, you must revere the sacred symbols of the past, all the while ruthlessly revising them. This is true not just with styles and cultural preferences, but more importantly with faith. Think about what we're doing right now here. Our church doesn't look like the church from 40 years ago or 100 years ago. We use different instruments with which to worship. We traded hard pews for padded chairs. We altered the look and the function of our buildings. We took off our ties. We added comfortable shoes or flip-flops or occasionally just socks. We traded dresses and slacks for jeans. And many of us read the Bible today on a screen instead of in paper. But we still have the Bible and we still have worship, and we still seek out and bow down to and claim the name of and the divinity of Jesus. We revered the sacred symbols, and we ruthlessly revised them. For the record, this is an important point, Jesus didn't need revision, but the way we approached him, the worship that we used, and other things, that did, it did need revision. And believe it or not, we took our cue for church revolution from Jesus himself, who did some not-so-subtle revisions of his own in the really important plot twist that we're going to look at today. This plot twist is so vital to the Jesus story that its account is recorded in all four Gospels, the four books of the Bible that tell us the story of Jesus albeit they did record the story of Jesus from different perspectives, still, the one we're going to look at today was so important that none of them wanted to leave it out, at least their version of it. And I think God really wants you and me to know what this plot twist means and why it matters to us today. So we're going to pick up the narrative in the final Days, the final hours really of Jesus' life, and he knows it's his final hours, even if his friends around him don't realize that yet. Hours before Jesus is arrested and then tortured and dies, he gathers around his closest friends. And Luke tells us about this. He says, Jesus is talking here now, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover feast with you, this Passover with you before I suffer. So just like you and me, uh, if we were in our last hours of life, and if we knew we were in our last hours of life, we would want those people closest to us around us. That's what Jesus does. He has with him uh, people, names you would recognize, and a few you wouldn't, like Peter and Andrew and James and John. Thomas is there. Philip, Mar Bartholomew, uh, Matthew is there. Uh, the second James, who we don't know much about, Thaddeus, uh, Simon, the other Simon, not Peter Simon, and even Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, is there. And this is a family meal. It's a family gathering. They don't exactly know all of the reason that they're there, but Jesus does. And, and family meals are important to us. But this is, not an important, uh, this is not an ordinary family meal, as important as it is. It's not normal. This is the Passover. This is the most important, richly symbolic meal for any Jew anywhere in that day and in this day, except that Jesus is about to ruthlessly revise it. Before we can understand what happens at the Last Supper table, and this is the story we're looking at is the Last Supper because it's Jesus's Last Supper. Before we can understand what happens at this moment, we have to back up and understand the Passover that is its foundation for this moment. Now, you can read about this in the opening chapters of the book of Exodus in your Bible, and I hope that you'll do that. But let me give you a summary of it, and I'm not going to hang out here for long. I'm just going to give you a lot of info, so try not to you know, glaze over. Try to you know, hang in there with me. It's just going to take a minute. Thousands of years before uh, Jesus the people of God, the Jewish people, sometimes called the Hebrews, they had been Jew, uh, slaves to uh, the pharaohs of Egypt. They had been in slavery there for 400 years. Now, 400 years is a long time. 
It's more than a dozen generations in our life expectancy, but people didn't live as long back then, so it's probably two or three times that many, maybe as many as 40 generations, which means that this slavery that these people have been in, if you were, if you were at the 300th year or the 400th year, harsh slavery, brutal beatings, unbearable workloads, life that really wasn't human, that kind of slavery is all these people have ever known. It's all their grandparents, 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 grandparents have ever known, long forgotten. Was, was any hope of a God who loved them or could hear them or might actually rescue them? They'd given up all that, but God didn't. And finally, he had enough. And so God sent Moses, you might have heard of him, and, and Moses goes before Pharaoh on God's behalf and demands that the Jews be set free. And of course, Pharaoh refuses. And so in order to get his attention, God sends to Pharaoh and the people of Egypt a series of plagues. First, he turns all the water everywhere into blood. And then that doesn't work, and so God sends swarms of frogs, millions of frogs, and then billions of gnats, and then trillions of flies, and then Livestock, all the livestock drop dead. That's one of the plagues. And then every Egyptian everywhere is ravaged by these awful boils on their skin. And, and that doesn't work. So then God sends this historic, epic, biblical proportion kind of hailstorm. And that doesn't work. So God sends a plague of locusts to devour whatever the hail didn't destroy in terms of the crops. And and in one of the plagues, the light of the sun is blocked everywhere on the whole earth except for the Jewish people. One plague after another, each one getting worse, and Pharaoh still refused, stubbornly refused, so. God sends one final devastating blow. Death. The death of every firstborn son in every family, everywhere, instantly, except for the Jews, the Hebrews. God provides a way for the Jewish people to be spared from the plague of death if, if they followed careful instructions. So if you've checked out, this is going to become relevant, so check back in. This is really important. On that night, the night that death would come through Egypt, the people of God were instructed to slaughter a perfect specimen of a lamb or a goat. The word that was sometimes used was unblemished. It was perfect in every way. They were to slaughter this lamb, and then they used the blood from the lamb, and they, they wiped it. They basically painted the doorpost around their house. And after they did that, they would, eat the, they would cook the animal and eat it. So that night, when God sent the death plague throughout Egypt, the death of every firstborn son, he would see the blood of the perfect lamb that was slain and sacrificed, painted on the doorpost, and death would then pass over that home and move on to another one, hence the Passover. For centuries, for generations, this would become the most sacred symbol of the Jewish faith. A Passover meal that was celebrated every single year to commemorate and remember what God did to rescue his people. Now that's what's in the background of this final night of Jesus' earthly life. The resolve that God had and still has to make a way for people to choose life instead of death. But for Jesus to permanently solve this death problem, a ruthless Revision would be required. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles, that just means his disciples, the guys I named and some other people, they sat down together at the table. And Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that, this, that, that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is sitting down to the Passover meal with his closest friends. And Passover was a huge feast. It was a grand and wonderful celebration. And I don't know how you feel about it, but anytime there's a feast, I don't know how you can't be happy about it. I mean, I love to eat. That, that's gotta be obvious. 
And I hate to tell you, but some of you love to eat too. Like we love to eat and we love to prepare for it. I mean, I'm the only one in my family who was trained and certified by my granny before she died to make corn and butter beans. And no, for the love of God, they are not called lima beans. We're in the South, people. God-fearing folk who know the difference between a lima bean and a butter bean, like the difference between Jesus and the devil. Butter beans also have to be cooked right. I'm serious now. You got to know, you, you know, I, I know some folks just pull a bag of steamed vegetables out of the freezer and stick it in the microwave for three minutes. I have one word for that, blasphemy. It just ain't right. And my granny were here, she'd just keel over just to think of such a thing happening. In order to properly cook a pot of butter beans or corn, you have to have the right kind of seasoning meat which would sort of make your heart doctor have a heart attack. And, and, and you have to have the right kind of vegetables and you have to have the right amount of salt and pepper and you gotta have a secret ingredient, which I really can't tell you about it. And you don't measure any of it. You just cook it for a long time, very slowly, every three or four hours and you taste it along the way until it's just right. And then you eat it not on a plate with a fork, but in a cup with some of the fat back juice and a spoon, praise the Lord. It's the difference between the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things, between heaven and hell, between bliss and damnation, amen. <laughs> For a Jew to anticipate the Passover was to anticipate a grand feast, a great celebration. And the food was different and the cooking styles were different. And there was a religious aspect to it, of course, but it was not a somber thing. There were not frowns. It might have been reverent, but only in a rejoicing and a fun kind of way. And at that meal, at every Passover meal, there were some special elements on the table. In addition to the rest of the feast, each one of these things would have a special symbolic meaning. Now, there are different traditions today, different Jewish traditions today, and they have some different things on the table. But every Passover meal has some of the same things, even today. There is a portion of bitter herbs on the plate, and that represents the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. And on every plate, there is the, the harrow set, which is a mixture of nuts and apples and some other ingredients, and it's designed to sort of look like mortar, like the mortar used to make bricks and to build walls under slavery in Egypt. And then, there uh, is always a boiled egg on the plate and there's always some uh, parsley on the plate and, and there's always, of course, the matzah. The matzah is a special piece of bread. This is a piece of bread that has uh, not been risen. There's no fermentation or yeast in it at all because on the night that God would deliver his people, on that very first Passover, he told them that they needed to be ready in a hurry. There would be no time for the bread to rise. So he instructed them to make special bread that had no yeast or leaven in it so that they could be ready to leave quickly. On every table, there is also the zroa bone. This is the, a bone that represents the, the perfect lamb that was slain for this special occasion because it was, this, it was the lamb that was slain that provided a way for them to avoid death and escape Egypt. That lamb was killed and the blood was spilled and then wiped on the doorposts. There were other things on the table. Every table had four glasses of wine, each with their own purpose. It had a bowl of water for ceremonially washing hands and a bowl of salt water and some other things. But this was a long-standing Passover tradition that still goes on today. It was all important. It was all sacred. It was all Meaningful, And yet, consider with me for a second. On that very first Passover, when God says, hey, well, I'm going to rescue you tomorrow from slavery, and they did all this ritual stuff, well, that really mattered. And on the first year anniversary, imagine the first year anniversary after they've been rescued, and they celebrate the Passover because God says, I want you to do this to remember what I did. Well, of course, everyone was there. It wasn't that long ago. And on the second anniversary and on the fifth anniversary and on the 10th anniversary and maybe on the 100th anniversary, but somewhere along the way, the, the process stopped being about connecting with God and started to just be a party. 
It started to become an empty religious ritual, an, an annual event. It just became tradition after a long period of time, repetition. Maybe, maybe the one time every year where these people actually remembered that they were the people of God, but still Passover stopped being about God mostly and became about the Jewish people. It became about their story and their oppression and their slavery and their exodus, of course. But somewhere along the way, though, though God's name was invoked a lot, the Passover stopped being about what God could do and became about what God did do or used to do. In any event, it was about the past, mostly, and it had little hope for this moment today. Tomorrow, after the Passover, things will be like they were yesterday before the Passover, and they'll be like that again until next year when we have another Passover. They kind of forgot that the same God who rescued their ancestors still wanted to rescue them. God always had a plan, even if they forgot about that, but Jesus was about to remind them all and us along the way too. Jesus was the revolution. And in order to prove it, he was about to insert a shocking revision, a ruthless revision. He took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. There they are, gathered around the table, expecting the normal routine. Here we go again experiencing the same ritual every year for the entirety of their lives, except that Jesus picks up this bread and says not the familiar words of their familiar Passover, but he makes a brand new statement. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want you to work at it now. I want you to insert yourself around that original Passover table with Jesus and his friends, just like we talked about. Imagine that you're there and see their expressions on their faces around the table. All the fidgeting stops, all the, all the side conversations see. Somebody leans over and whispers and says, what did he just say? I mean, it's one thing to do some of the things that Jesus has been doing. I mean, healing people on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to do that. And talking to women in public, you're not supposed to do that. And ticking off the Pharisees, you're really not supposed to do that. Those things are gutsy. But making changes to the Passover meal? Are you kidding? Have you ever, have you ever done something, messed with something that somebody else considered to be untouchable and sacred? Maybe, maybe you haven't. I, I walked on my dad's Corvette one time, you know, when it was still his and not yet mine and I was still a kid. It was new to dad. It was in the garage. It was black and shiny. And I was too lazy to go around it to get what I wanted on the other side of the car. And so I walked on the hood and it was so dumb. I was so dumb that I, I didn't know to get rid of the evidence. And how dumb can you be? So to make matters worse, while I'm confronting my dad, I'm staring at him, the car's behind me, I lied about walking on the car, my fresh oily footprints glaring behind me. You would have thought that I had personally betrayed Jesus and handed him over to the Pharisees. I never walked on the car again, for the record. Another time, I, I, I had an organ moved in a church. According to local folklore, it had never been moved. It had been there dating back to the flood or some ancient time. It was like somebody walked through the woods and saw an organ with a light from heaven shining on it and said, oh, maybe we should build a church around this. <laughs> I moved it. I messed with something sacred. I got called one time early in the life of our church. We were growing rapidly and reaching people. And, and this church called and said, hey, come help us. We'd like to reach people around us too. And we don't know what to do. And we got all these people who don't go to church around us. Can you come help us? And, and so... I, you know, I went and attended their church a couple of times and I made my assessment and they told me to tell them the truth. <laughs> so I said, your choir sounds so bad. If I died and went to hell, that's what the choir would sound like every Sunday. Maybe you ought to find somebody who can actually sing. I know, it was too far. 
They didn't ask me to come back and to give them any more advice. Whatever sacred thing you can imagine, there is nothing more sacred, more untouchable in religious life then or today than the Passover. I want you to imagine for a second, listen, let, let, your, let your emotions hit you when I say these words. Imagine I stood on this platform and I could prove to you that I was holding an original copy of the Declaration of Independence, the original one with the original signatures. Can you see it? Now imagine me shredding it in front of you. Imagine me taking a Bible and lighting a match to it and burning it on this platform. How would that make you feel? Because there is nothing more entrenched than the Passover, nothing more sacred, not the papacy, not the Vatican, nothing. And here, it's, it's completely untouchable, and here Jesus is, completely redefining it. This is my body now, he says. It's broken for you. This bread no longer stands for what, what, what you once did or even what God once did. It now stands for what I, the Son of God, the perfect unblemished lamb, am about to do, what I have resolved to do for you. And is, as if that wasn't enough, Jesus takes the wine and he makes the most incredible, boldest revision with the most remarkable words, I would argue, are in the entire Bible. Two words like the I will of a wedding, only a million times more potent. Two words that will actually redefine the whole Bible. The entire Jewish people, the whole world, the history of mankind. And two words that ought to redefine your life and mine. Two simple words. This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood now, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. New covenant. The old covenant was a promise of sacrifice for sure, but it was a sacrifice required from you. The lamb that was slain in, in the moment of that Passover meal, it was only as good as long as our hearts remained pure, which lasted usually until the food got cold. Because corruption sets in, it's true for me and it's true for you too. New sins get committed, new thoughts that betray us, repeating addictions and actions and hurtful words and our stubborn refusal to go with God. The old covenant was restrained by the old covenant covenant was imprisoned by a never-ending suicidal brokenness that you and i share it's defined by this internal fight against wrong and evil and it's constantly betrayed by our desire to to do and to be all that god wants us to be we're torn that was a covenant. The old covenant was one that was defined by a never-ending need to kill another lamb, which made another sacrifice, which received another atonement so that we could avoid another judgment. It was like terminal cancer, one that allowed us to have treatment that would prolong life but never really did anything about the underlying condition. So we just kill another lamb, buy a little time, kill another lamb, buy a little time. All the while, we were slowly but surely losing the battle until that first generation, the first Passover experienced people were gone. And then the next was gone. And then the next until literally countless sacrifices have been made. A billion, billion lambs slaughtered. The cycle was never ending. But where the old covenant had required a sacrifice from you, the new covenant would be a sacrifice for you. The old covenant had to be repeated and renewed. This new covenant would be one time and for all. Where the old covenant was a single group of people, this new covenant would be for all people. Where the old covenant said, this is what God did, the new covenant would say, this is what God is still doing. Where the old covenant said, God loved Moses and his people, the new covenant would say, God so loved the world. Where the old covenant required the blood of a lamb, this new covenant would require the blood of the lamb, the spotless, perfect, 
unblemished, incomparable, incomprehensible Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world by once and for all paying the price that I could never pay with a sacrifice I could never make. This is God's promise. And while you and I don't always keep ours, God, through Jesus Christ, kept his. And his promise still stands today. The blood of the ultimate Passover lamb on my life means life for me instead of death. The broken body and the spilled blood of Jesus washes the sin away in the eyes of God. His brokenness is what makes us whole. Like the last night of Jesus' life, because he told us to remember what he did, we sometimes together eat a piece of bread and drink from a cup. And it isn't just about the past anymore. It's about this moment right here, a moment when God is still at work, still renewing and remaking and restoring and revering the sacred symbol while ruthlessly revising it. Now it's our turn to join in the new covenant of Jesus, to remember the ruthless revision of this sacred symbol and how it affects our lives. So if you're at home watching online, this is the time where you can go get bread and juice and partake in this communion with us. You can do that right now, wherever you are. If you're in this room at Powhatan, we have four tables up here, four stations with the elements on it. And we have two there in the back, in the middle. I'd ask that if you're in the front half of the room before those tables, you would come to the front. And if you're on the outsides of the room on either side section, you would go to the tables on the side. And if you're in the back and you can see those tables in the back that you would come meet in the middle. This might take a moment, so there's a lot of us in here, so it's okay, be patient. We ask that you would take this at the table. It's all there for you, separated. That you would partake at the table, and there are trash cans beside where you can throw it away, and then you would return to your seat as we continue to remember a little more. This is the time. Let's eat and drink in remembrance of Jesus. Let's do it now.
shed your blood, your body broken for me, and by your wound, I am set free, how deep your love, Lord, that we may be in your presence, for all eternity. This I do in remembrance of you. We remember how Jesus ruthlessly revised the Passover dinner for his closest followers. We remember how he has ruthlessly revised our own lives. And we ask him to keep editing and changing them into the lives that he wants for us. Now next Sunday, we will remember how Jesus defeated death. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you then.